Uh, who was at my talk just before this one? Uh, you guys are brave. You are going to listen to me talk for another hour. I am so sorry for you. Uh, this talk is a little more engineering focused. Uh, it's called Agility Requires Safety. And uh, I've worked with a lot of startups in my career. Uh, it's kind of what I do for a living now. And the story tends to be more or less the same. The startup tells me something like, we don't have time for best practices. We're in a hurry. We've got to ship product, right? We don't have time to do it right. So apparently they have time to do it again. And so you know, the, the outcome is pretty predictable, right? There's, there's no monitoring. There's no alerting. Documentation? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, not too much in the way of DevOps as a general rule. They sort of throw things over the wall and hope for the best. Uh, definitely no automated testing, right? That's crazy. But there are a lot of bugs. Lots and lots and lots of little bugs. And so coding at a startup can often feel something like this, right? You try to make a little change and it takes three weeks. You make a small <laughs> performance tweak and the entire site goes down. And at some point, you're just afraid to touch the code and it's just infuriating. Nothing works. <laughs> so that's the thing. You can't really go faster by being reckless. There's a lot of people that think that if they just throw all the processes out the window, they'll magically go much faster. But the reality is more like this, right? If you have cars on a highway, what would happen if everyone decided to be reckless and just jam down on the gas pedal? <laughs> <laughs> you can guess, right? <laughs> And that's, that's kind of what you're saying, right? When you're saying, I don't need tests and I don't need any of these things, I'll get it out faster, well, maybe in the short term, sure. And then you're going to have a massive crash and a massive pileup. And in reality, you'll be sitting in traffic for hours and you'll have to get there much later, if you get there at all. So the reality is that to go faster, you need not just a powerful engine, you also need powerful brakes. You also need seat belts and airbags and bumpers. <coughs> with self-driving cars, all sorts of autopilot features. And so the reality is that for cars and for software, your speed is limited by safety. You can only go fast if you're sure that what you're going to do is not going to create more damage than actual benefit. And uh, so I guess the question of today's talk is, what are the seat belts, the brakes, the self-driving car equivalents for software? And so this is a talk about safety mechanisms that allow you to build software faster, that actually allow you to go fast. Uh, I'm Evgeny Brickman. I guess you guys all have heard that. You know that I'm the founder of Atomic Squirrel. We help companies launch and scale their infrastructure. Uh, previous lives, worked at a bunch of other companies, helped them build and scale their infrastructure. Uh, wrote a book about startups and building products, technologies, and teams. Uh, I mentioned this at the previous talk, but I think you guys have a copy of this in your library. If you want one in your personal library, uh, tweet out the website for the book, hello-startup.net, and then the hashtag startups. And then tomorrow I'll go through those tweets and pick a few winners and ship you guys a free book. Um, so this is the outline for the talk today. I'm going to look at a bunch of safety mechanisms from cars and boats and elevators, and we're going to figure out what the analogs are. So we're going to start with brakes. So good brakes in a car stop you before you hit something. The equivalent of brakes for the software world is something like continuous integration, which will stop your code before it blows up in production. Uh, do you guys do trunk-based development, or do you use branches, by the way? Sorry? Branches. Cool. So here's why you shouldn't. <laughs> um, imagine your goal was to build the International Space Station. <laughs> it's this huge, massive, complicated piece of technology, tons and tons of components, and you decided that a different country was going to build each of those components. And so you told them, you gave them basically some basic instructions, you said, go off and go build them. And each of those countries went off, and for years they worked in complete isolation building those components, and then you decided to launch them into outer space and try to assemble everything together. How do you think that's going to work out? Probably something like that. Somebody thought, well, I thought, I thought the Russians were building the batteries. And somebody else says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean the French didn't do the wiring for this thing? But I've been building for years thinking they did the wiring. 
And then every country seems to be using the metric system, except one really weirdo country that refuses. <laughs> and so the problem here is that these teams are working for really long times, for a really long time, with incorrect assumptions. Something that they believe to be true for months and months of development are not. And uh, finding that out when you've already launched everything into outer space is way, way too late. So this is what's called late integration. And we see this in software all the time, right? You have lots of teams all working on their separate feature branches, doing commits, working in total isolation. That's slightly misaligned. OK, apologies for the text being a little off, probably different resolution. And uh, at the end, when you want to release, you create a release branch, and everybody tries to slam all of their work together into one release branch at the very end, and the result is a giant, horrible merge conflict that takes forever to resolve. So this is what we had at LinkedIn, actually, back around 2009. We had tons and tons of feature branches, teams working for weeks or months in total isolation, and at the end, we tried to do a release branch, and it was a disaster. Every single time, it was a disaster. People, it would take weeks to stabilize weeks to stabilize this thing, to get it back to a working shape, to deal with the fact that some file you've been editing for two weeks has been deleted in the meantime, or moved, or refactored. And it was very hard to get anything done. And so the alternative to this is what's called continuous integration. And the idea here is you regularly merge your work together, sometimes multiple times a day, instead of working for weeks in isolation. And the most common approach to doing this is what's called trunk-based development. The idea here is you have a single branch, usually called trunk or master, and everybody, every engineer, does all of their work on this one branch. Which, if you're doing feature branches, may sound a little insane, right? That's, this sounds like total craziness, right? There's no way that can scale. Maybe if you have two developers, but how can a team of 30 or 300 possibly all check into the same branch at the same time? Well, LinkedIn uses it for now over 1,000 developers. Facebook for over 4,000 developers. Google uses trunk-based development for more than 20,000 developers, all checking into one branch for all of their work. And the Google stats actually are pretty insane. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this talk, but they have two billion lines of code in that one branch. And they make 45,000 commits per day, all into the same branch. So yes, it scales pretty darn well. Now. Questions you may have about trunk-based development. Wouldn't you get merge conflicts all the time, right? What's, you know, if, if we get merge conflicts at the end of feature branches, wouldn't, you, wouldn't this be a daily reality? No, not really. The reason is this. If you're working in feature branches, then you've been touching files for a month, and during that month, there's a good chance somebody else touched the same files. <coughs> but if you're all working on the same branch and you're checking in every day, then the odds of conflicts are actually much, much lower. And when a conflict happens, it's much easier to fix because it's from a day of work rather than months and months and months of work. And usually most of them are just figured out automatically by your version control system. So the reality is that trunk-based development reduces conflicts to just the ones that are important to fix anyway, and they're pretty easy to fix. So the lesson there is you should commit early and often. And this actual strategy actually is really beneficial for a lot of reasons. So one, it makes merges and conflicts a lot easier. It's actually a lot easier to test when all you know is that you know, one day of work has changed rather than all of a sudden you get three months of work dumped on you. It's a lot easier to revert in case there's something wrong with the commit. And it's a lot easier to review small commits. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this kind of idea, right? You submit a code review with 10 lines of code in it, you get 10 comments, and you submit a code review with your 500 line feature branch. Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah, that's great. Good. Small commits are huge safety mechanism that helps in, in every way uh, to go faster. Now, another question about trunk-based development. Well, wouldn't your code constantly be broken, right? If everyone's checking into the same branch, it's going to be mayhem. Everything's going to be broken all the time. The way you avoid code being broken in trunk is you have what's called a self-testing build. So you have a commit hook. After every single commit, you run a build. And that build compiles the code and runs your tests. And if there's any kind of a problem, it immediately notifies the developer who made the commit, and that developer basically gets you know, an hour to either revert the commit or fix it, and preferably a minute. So you really keep the branch, you keep trunk in a working state. Now, obviously, that depends on having good automated tests. So 
you shouldn't do continuous integration and trunk-based development unless you have a reasonable suite of tests to sanity check your code. So if you don't have that, don't jump into it. It will be a disaster. But once you have a good suite of tests, you actually end up going much, much faster this way. So some interesting things about tests. Tests are often seen as this overhead, right? Instead of writing a little bit of code, now you have to write even more code to test your code so it takes longer. The reality is that good tests actually let you go much faster. They let you change code quickly. And the reason for that is you can run hundreds, maybe thousands of tests, if they're well written, in seconds. How long would it take you to do 259 tests by hand? How many hours would you waste? And so the alternative to good, fast tests is broken code. And believe me, it takes longer to fix code than it does to write tests and prevent the breakages. But still, there is a good question of what should you test. And the answer, of course, is absolutely everything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's test purists who believe you have to test everything and have 100% code coverage, but I think that's actually unreasonable. I think what you can do is trade off a few factors and come up with a really nice suite of tests. And there's three things you need to consider when you're deciding what to test and how much to test it. The first is the likelihood of bugs, then the cost of bugs, and then the cost of testing. So the likelihood of bugs goes up as your team size goes up and as your code base grows. And I'll show you the stats in, in the next section, so in just a couple minutes. But it goes up really quickly. So if you have a few hundred lines of code, it doesn't matter. You can probably get by without tests. Team size grows, the likelihood of bugs increases. And by the time you're up to 300 developers, you basically can't make any progress unless you have tests, because it's just too much code. Um, now, the cost of bugs is where I think a lot of the testing purists get things wrong. If you're at a startup, a lot of the code you write is probably going to get thrown away. Constantly testing assumptions, you're building these MVPs, you throw them away, they don't work. And so writing tests for code that's going to be thrown away, not that valuable, right? Because the cost of a bug in code that gets thrown away is not that high. But every startup has certain areas where errors and bugs are just not acceptable. And every startup I've talked to has pretty darn thorough automated testing, usually around things like payment systems, you don't want to charge a credit card twice, or not at all, uh, security systems, you don't want people breaking into your site. So things like that should be tested much more thoroughly. Because if you get it wrong, it's really, really expensive. And finally, the cost of tests. You'll find that in the modern day, writing unit tests is really cheap. Just about every framework, every build system makes it trivial to do it. If you do them right, they run extremely fast. They give you really fast feedback. And the cost is really, really low. So unit tests, almost always worth writing and writing quite a bit. Integration tests? A little harder, right? Now you need more of your stack up and running. You have to do a little more manual work to put that together. They run a little slower. And finally, UI tests have to have everything up and running, and they're the slowest by far. And the thing is, tests that don't give you feedback quickly aren't a very good safety mechanism. If it takes you 10 hours to run your tests and you don't hear back for 10 hours if your code works, throw those tests away. They're, just not, they're not helping you. They're not protecting anybody or anything. So you make a trade-off. You do a lot of unit tests, fewer integration tests, and a small number of very valuable UI tests is the usual balance. And this is why continuous integration is valuable. Because if you don't have it, the default state of your code is broken. The default state of any feature branch, the default state of anything is broken. It doesn't work. But when you add continuous integration, you reverse that. The default state of your code is that it's working, assuming you have decent tests. And that means you can deploy it any time. That means you can deploy it 50 times a day if you want to. Because your code, by default, is working. And all you're doing is keeping it that way. And it's a huge benefit. And it's really one of the most essential safety mechanisms you can use. Now, the second one are bulkheads. This is uh, from ships. When you build a ship, you separate different parts of the ship into these compartments that are sealed off from each other. And the idea is if the ship hits something and water starts leaking into one of the compartments, it's sealed off from the other, so it doesn't get into those, and the whole ship doesn't sink because of one issue, usually. The Titanic being a fairly notable exception. Um, the equivalent of bulkheads in software are splitting up your code base. And here's why this is important. Even if you're a programmer, it turns out that code is really the enemy. The more code you have, the slower you will go. More code is actually a problem. And the numbers on this are actually kind of astounding. So this is code complete. Hopefully you guys have read that book. If not, 
grab himself a coffee. And what they did is they looked at projects based on how many lines of code. And obviously, the bigger the project, the more bugs it had. But they actually measured not how many bugs, but the bug density. How many bugs per 1,000 lines of code. And so when you have a small project, you have somewhere between 0 and 25. But when you have over half a million lines of code, you have between 4 and 100 bugs for every 1,000 lines of code. 100 bugs per 1,000 lines of code. Every 10 lines you write has a bug by the time you're in a code base with over half a million lines of code. So what that means is as a code base grows, the number of bugs grows even faster. So the practices you use with 10,000 lines will not work when you hit 100,000 lines. And those will not work when you hit a million lines. They just won't because the bug density will be much, much higher and you'll be going much, much slower. Now, the reason for this, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this, but probably the main one is that software development isn't something that happens in a chart or your IDE or any tool. It happens in your head. And the human mind is kind of limited. You can't put the model of half a million lines of code into your head. It doesn't fit. You can't consider all those corner cases. You can't consider all those interconnections. And so the only real solution when the code base gets really big is to start thinking about how can I break it up into these sort of bulkheads so I can focus on one part of the code and safely ignore everything else and know that if I work on this code, I'm not going to break everything else in the universe and have a bug for every 10 lines of code that I write. By the way, do you guys any, have any sense how many lines of code you have in your code base? So we, we are split up into a lot of pieces, so micro, microservices, micro apps. Um, but I just pulled, I just pulled uh, LOCs for a handful of those repos for security consultants. I have the, I want to say AAA is one of the bigger, bigger ones. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys have, I think you guys about, yeah, yeah. I throw that, you know. No, I, I think you guys have like 10,000 lines of code. Uh, how, total. Many, how many repos do we even have? Like yeah, we, uh, you, you can't count all the end wallet yeah, underscore. Those are those are chef. Those are chef oh, scripts. But but yeah, in terms of production code, there's still there are there are a lot of repos. But each one is is actually in the grand scheme of things quite small. Yeah. Okay, so actually, you guys are pretty much doing what I'm about to talk about already. So that's cool. Um, and so, yeah, one option, and it seems like you guys are doing actually both of these, but I'll go over them really quick, is instead of, uh, is you basically have multiple code bases. So if everything was in one giant monolith, all of your modules de depend directly on the source code of the other modules. And the real important thing is not necessarily whether they're in separate repos or not, but that you manage dependencies by managing, by depending on a specific artifact, a specific versioned artifact of another module. Is this what you guys are doing? I mean, I know you're not using Java, right? You're JavaScript. It's a mix of breaking the microservices as well as breaking the libraries that are produced again. Got it. Okay. And so, of course, when you do libraries and you have version artifacts, the, the benefit you get is isolation, right? You, maybe module A depends on version 3 of module B, and that's a fixed version. So no matter what the module B folks are doing, it doesn't affect module A. They can break things, they can make changes, and to, the, to a large extent, module A would never know it, which is good. Um, and even if you guys weren't doing this, you do this anyway with the open source work, right? If you depend on some open source library, you're grabbing some specific version of it. And in the meantime, the open source community keeps evolving it and it doesn't affect you until you upgrade to it. So the advantages, and you can tell me which of these you guys are seeing and which, which of these you're not, are of course isolation. So teams can work completely separate from each other and not worry about breaking somebody else, especially with unrelated changes. Um, it does encourage the <coughs> top of your code. When everything is one giant code base, Everything tends to get mixed together, kind of like a bunch of wires in a box. And so you try to change one thing and you pick up and all the other wires come with it. When you break up into separate repos, you're much more explicit about dependencies, which is a good thing. And actually, one of the other hidden benefits is it's, you get faster builds. Each repo is much smaller, and so it builds much quicker than if everything was in one repo. But maybe you guys are seeing some of these disadvantages as well. Um, one is dependency hell. And this is worse in some languages than others. But as soon as you start defining these modules, uh, you're going to start finding out that you have all sorts of weird dependency trees. So we go back to that diagram. So module A depends on B, and it also depends on C. But imagine B also depended on C, but a different version of C. So now when you pull it into module A, which version of C do you get? The one that A wants or the one that B wants? Neither. 
blows up and tells you what screw yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Depending on the language, actually. JavaScript and NPM can somewhat handle it gracefully. Java handles it very, very poorly. You just get a jar and you don't know which one and good luck to you. Um, and so it really depends on the language. Uh, there's also other issues, right? You start running into like circular dependencies, which never exist when you have one repo. It never leaves in one repo. But now if, if E wanted to depend back on C or anything else, you create a circle and it, your code won't compile. Uh, you can have diamond dependencies, which are really fun. And then upgrading dependencies becomes an absolute nightmare if you have to make a change all over the place. Don't know, somebody's smiling in the back. I'm wondering if this is what you said. So, of course, you also don't have continuous integration. Now, this isn't as bad. If everything was in one repo and you don't have continuous integration, that's a problem because everyone's working on exactly the same code. If you're in separate repos, then the fact that those two are not integrating is not as big a deal. There aren't conflicts, you don't know, merge separate repos. But still, some team can go off and make lots and lots of changes. And when somebody else tries to upgrade to the new version of their artifact, it doesn't work. You can mitigate that with semantic versioning and following certain rules, but at the end of the day, the isolation is a double-edged sword. Um, and the other, do you have a question? Um, the other issue is it's really hard to make global changes. So the whole point of bulkheads is to make it hard to do something to all of them at the same time, which is a good thing if all of your repos really are isolated. But imagine you have to apply a security fix to all of them at the same time. If you have 100 repos, that's going to take a really long time. It's also hard just to work with multiple repos. You can't, it's harder to search the code, right? You have to check out like 20 repos and do a wrap across all 20 of them. Um, so global changes get really hard. So artifacts are very, very good if your code really is isolated. Most of the work you do is in one repo and really has no impact on anyone else in the world. They're not so good if you break up, for example, a single web UI into 29 artifacts. And then you also have to change some major thing across all of them. That's going to be really painful, especially when you mix it with dependency hell. Because then you upgrade this guy at the bottom of the tree, you try to upgrade this guy, but this guy is still pointing to an old version, and it's, it's an absolute thing. Um, the other way to break up your code, sounds like you're doing this as well, is services, or the new buzzword is microservices. I don't know why that gave it cooler, but all right. Um, and so the idea here is when you have a monolithic app, everything is just function calls in memory. And when you break it up into services, everything becomes a, a message, a remote call between different processes. So the nice things about this are you can be technology based. If everything's in a monolith running in a single service, then you're going to use one programming language and one framework and just be on approach. If you have different services, one can be written in JavaScript, one can be Python, Java, it doesn't matter if you're communicating remotely. And that's good because you can use the right problem for each job. Uh, excuse me, the right tool for each problem. Um, another big advantage of services is scalability. If everything is in one service, then you kind of can only scale it to the lowest common denominator. So if some part of it is not horizontally scalable, none of it is horizontally scalable. Whereas when you break up into services, you can give one service tons of CPU, you can give another service 50 servers to distribute across, and you can scale each one individually and make sure. And you get isolation, but not quite as much. So the isolation in services is good. For the most part, each team can own one service and can run with it and largely ignore the others, except for its public API. I'll come back to that in a second. So services actually have a lot of disadvantages. Smile, if you've seen some of these. Um, operational overhead is pretty intense with services. You have lots of technologies. Well, now you need to have lots of different ways to configure them monitor them, deploy them. You also have to have them now all talk to each other, which means you need to build new infrastructure for some kind of service discovery. Because right? if we look at this diagram, how does A know what the URL is of B? What if B goes down and comes up with a different URL? You either need to deploy load balancers, or you have to write client-side load balancer code and run something like Zookeeper or console to the new service discovery. It's a whole new piece of infrastructure just to manage and support this. Um, there's a lot of performance over. When everything's a function call, it's all just in memory. When everything's a remote call, it's making a round trip in your data center, which is going to be two to three orders of magnitude slower. So you can't just take a monolith and just change all the function calls to remote calls. The performance will be atrocious. Right? You'll be doing some service call in the for loop, and your 
So you also now have to think much more carefully about when you call services, how often you call services, do you cache those requests? And as you modify your code to handle all that performance, I oh, also serialization, deserialization, all that over it. But as you're doing that, you now also have to change how you write your code. Because it's no longer a function call, you now are blocking a thread potentially, depending on the type of you're using. So what happens if you use threads and blocking I.O. calls, those remote services? Well, let's say, go back to this diagram, uh, A, uh, sorry, C is calling service E. Let's say E gets a little slow for some reason. Well, now the threads in C are blocked for longer. So now it starts to run out of threads. So now C gets a little slower. Well, now the threads in A are going to get blocked for a bit longer. And it's going to get slower. And basically, a small slowdown somewhere at the bottom of your stack can cascade throughout the entire data center. And also, you have a site outage for some database query that a little slow. So threads are bad. So then what you have to do is you have to change your programming model. You have to rewrite your code to either use something like callbacks or promises, or futures, or actors, basically some sort of non-blocking things, which reduces that cascading failure scenario, but now you have to rewrite all of your code in a more complicated program. You also have to handle a whole new class of errors, right? Because a function call, you're pretty much going to get back results. But a remote call, you fail. The timeout, it takes too long. There's all sorts of problems. You might call the wrong service and get invalid data back. So your code is going to look weird. Now, I mentioned services give you isolation. And to a large extent, they do, with the exception of the public API that the service exposes. All of a sudden, changing that API becomes really hard. When you add a monolith, all you do is you change the API and you change all the other people calling it. When you have a microservice, you have to find all the clients that are calling your public API. You have to change their code to no longer call it. You have to wait for them to redeploy, which is really hard if you're not doing continuous integration because they might be in a broken state. And only after all of that can you finally remove that endpoint and redeploy your service. So backwards compatibility means it's actually harder to rely on APIs and your services. And once again, the whole point of bulkheads is isolation, but that means global changes are hard. It's also really hard to share code if your services are built in different languages. And this is something like in we had services that were in Java, we had services that were in Ruby, and Python, and JavaScript. And then we had things like, well, we want them all to do logging the same way. Or we want them all to do monitoring the same way. Or we want them all to do authentication the same way. You can't really share that code anymore. There's libraries that you wrote in one language don't work in another. And so either you copy them, which is a lot of overhead, or you move that functionality into a service as well, which you can only do with some types of functionality. You can't really log into a service. And now you have another piece of infrastructure. So services are awesome if you need to use separate technologies. Services are awesome if you have really tough stability challenges. Services are not awesome in a lot of other ways. And they're only worth doing if you can afford to fix all of these issues. If you can afford the operational order. If you can set up a service discovery. If you can rewrite all of your code to deal with the performance of blocking and non-blocking trade-offs, services are great. The isolation is awesome for separate teams to be truly separate, but it's something to keep in mind as you consider whether we should go from, how, how many services do you think we have right now? So <clears throat> the thing is that it, for, the, the architecture tends to be like, for a particular product, there is a service backing it. Um, and so the actual like service ecosystem for any given product is actually quite small. Uh, but we have maybe a couple platform services they might hit, so grand total per product, in the two to five, two to four, two to four range. Yeah. Now, we're, we're a broad, we're a broad product ecosystem. So across all of our products, you know, it's more like 10, 15 different services, something like that. But they're in, they're not, they're not all interconnected. Yeah. Um, and most of, well, <clears throat> we do things to try to mitigate some of this stuff. Okay. Keep that in mind. Uh, the reason I bring it up is 10 to 15. I think that's manageable. LinkedIn had several hundred services, and these things don't. These complexities don't increase linearly. They also increase kind of exponentially. So keep that in mind when you decide, oh, let's just put this new functionality in a totally brand new service. It has a very high cost. So keep that in mind. OK, autopilot. Um, autopilot in self-driving cars and planes prevents accidents by removing human error from the equation. Autopilot equivalent in software is automated deployment. Do you guys do automated deployments or manual deployments? We do automated 
All right, so I'll go through the section pretty quickly. It sounds like you're doing most of this already. Um, at LinkedIn, actually, back in 2009 and before, a lot of the deployments were done largely by hand. People SSHing places and running shell scripts by hand, and provisioning servers by hand. And it was painful, to put it mildly. Um, deployments could take hours, days. Sometimes we'd give up on them part of the way through and just say, let's, let's try again later. Um, and it turns out the solution to this was to do it more often. If it hurts, do it more often. And the only way to do that, of course, is if your deployment process looks approximately like that. It's a button. There's no process. You just push a button and the rest of it happens automatically. Hopefully it sounds like you guys are doing that. It's great. Um, hopefully what you're not doing. Do you guys run on AWS or what do you use for hosting? AWS? Cool. So hopefully what you're not ever doing is SSHing to an EC2 instance and installing dependencies. Somebody's nodding. Someone is shaking their head. So, okay, we'll assume you're good. Do you guys use this? Do you use the AWS console to deploy any of your infrastructure? Do you use it to provision any of the servers? Yes, no, maybe? All right. As, as a rule of thumb, you know how there's code smells where you see something in your code that feels wrong and you feel like you should fix it? Think of the AWS console as a code smell. If you find yourself logging in here to do more than look at like monitoring, like CloudWatch or something like that, think of that as a code smell. Um, you really want to automate just about everything. Uh, do you guys do blue-green deployments, rolling deployments? Rolling? How do you do the rolling deployments? Okay. So blue-green deployment is, in theory, the gold standard to aim for. And it's one of these things that only really works if you automate it. Just really quick overview of how it works. You're running version 1 of your app, which is the blue. And you want to deploy version 2. So you actually deploy it on a duplicate set of hardware. But you don't point any traffic on it until it's fully up and running. Maybe you do some sanity checks on it. And then, when it's fully up and running, in one quick switch, you move the load balancer over to version two. And this is the best possible user experience, right? When you do rolling deployments, depending on how long they take, the user might refresh the page and one time see the old version, refresh the page, get, a new, get one of the new servers, see the new version, and keep switching back and forth. This largely mitigates it. And there's four main categories of tools. I'm curious which ones you guys are using and which ones you're not. Um, and this space is evolving shockingly quickly, actually. So it's, it's hard to keep up with it. Um, one set is configuration management tools, like Chef, and Puppet, and things like that. Are you guys using any of these? Chef and Chef and Ansible, OK. So you're more than familiar with these. You're basically writing imperative scripts that have a step-by-step -step recipe of how to deploy your code, how to configure your servers. This is a YAML script that installs Apache and starts Apache and copies some code to it uh, from Ansible. And one of the alternatives that's starting to come around, it, by the way, these don't all solve exactly the same problem, so you may use more than one of these types of tools, um, are provisioning tools that are coming out, such as Terraform, uh, CloudFormation's actually been around for a while, and OpenStack just released something called Heat. And these, instead of an imperative approach, they try to give you a declarative language to describe your infrastructure. This usually isn't done to deploy new versions of code, but it is used to provision all of your servers, your load balancers, your database. This basically is a declarative language for describing your infrastructure. This is a Terraform template. Um, it basically describes an AWS instance, a server, and you can set all sorts of properties for it. And then uh, the next uh, resource, it assigns an elastic IP address to it. And you can see that the IP address references the server. And so from that, these tools can build a dependency graph. They can visualize your dependency graph and then deploy it in parallel. Which is pretty cool. That's actually hard to do by hand with scripting tools and configuration management tools. But you might use both. You might use this to set up your hardware, and then you might use like Chef or Puppet or Ansible to deploy things onto that hardware, such as a new version of your code. The third category are virtual machines. So VMware and VirtualBox build virtual machines. They virtualize the hardware, and you can run an image of an operating system and code on it. And then there's tools like Packer and Vagrant which give you a decorative, or not really a decorative, but a language to define what will be in that virtual machine image. So for example, this is a Packer template, which says, I'm going to create an Amazon machine image, an AMI. And you have some properties for it, but then down here, you basically describe what, to, what that image should contain. And so this one is going to install Apache and PHP, but obviously you can have arbitrary shell commands, you can do whatever you want on that box. And from that, it's going to create this virtual machine image it has everything you want already installed on it, and now you can run it in dev or anywhere in prod, and it'll run the same way, which is really cool. Now, the downside to virtual machines is they're pretty heavy and slow. 
virtualizing things has a lot of overhead, a lot of cost. They take up extra RAM, they take longer to start. And so the new hotness <laughs> that's been rolling out, as I'm sure you're all aware, are containers, the most popular, which is Docker. And the easiest way to think of them is just as lightweight VMs. So they don't actually virtualize the hardware. They just use process and user and permission isolation to run your code on the native operating system, but the code doesn't realize it. It sees it as if it's a completely virtualized operating system. And so this is a Docker file that basically says, that Docker comes with a language, again, for saying what you want in these lightweight images. And here it says, I want to start with Ubuntu. I want to install uh, Apache and PHP on it, set some environment variables, and when you run this image, it's going to run Apache. And you have this really nice descriptive language for explaining what that code is going to do. And you can start up a full instance of Ubuntu on your computer in less than a second. You can run 20 of these on your computer because they take up a very little memory each. And so containers are very, very popular. They're really starting to grow. They're a little immature, so I wouldn't necessarily jump to them for all use cases. But for something like a stateless server that's complicated to configure, this is a huge, huge win. Um, and the real power of these sorts of things is you can actually define your infrastructure as code. And that's a powerful concept. If you haven't seen it before, this, this idea that you can write code to describe both the hardware you're going to be using in your data center and the software that's running on it is important. Because now, all of a sudden, you can version your infrastructure. You can code review your infrastructure. You can test your infrastructure. You can reuse it, right? If you deploy your entire stack in a staging environment, you can reuse that same code to do it in a production environment. So these are some really cool tools that are coming out. Uh, we help a lot of companies set them up. Um, and they put you on autopilot. So next one is the safety catch. <laughs> uh, in the 19th century, uh, buildings were getting taller, but elevators were horrifically unsafe. Uh, if the cable snapped, you would plunge to your death. So people just refused to use it. And this guy named Elijah Otis came along, and he did this insane demonstration in 1854 where he built this huge elevator shaft that was completely open. He lifted himself up on this elevator to several stories high, and then in front of the whole audience, he had his, his partner cut the cable. And the elevator fell, but only a couple inches, and then immediately came to a stop. And this was called the safety bump. Now, the way that it works, if you look, this is the patent. And so basically, this thing in the middle is the this whole tall rectangle is the elevator shaft, that's the elevator, that's the cable. Um, if you look at it, it has these safety catches. And the default position for the safety catches is they're extended. That's their default state. Which means the elevator can't move because they hook onto the uh, latches going up and down the elevator shaft. So the default, the elevator can't move. And what you need to do to disengage those is you need to have a cable pull up, or you know, the elevator pull down, and when that pulls up, those safety catches come in. And so the only way the elevator can move is if there's an intact cable. And as soon as you cut the cable, those catches go back down. And what that means is these safety catches, this elevator design, it provides safety by default. The default state is everything is safe and good to go. And the equivalent of that with software are feature toggles. Are you guys using feature toggles? Are you familiar with what they are? Sometimes called feature flags. <coughs> so some people nodding, some people shaking their heads. So I'll go through them. Um, oops, and answer that all today. Um, so imagine you're building a really large new feature, and you're doing continuous integration. And the question is, you know, it's going to take you more than a day to finish a large feature. So how do you commit early and often without ending up with some code in your trunk that a user will see? How do you prevent users from seeing unfinished features? The answer is, um, so imagine this is your web page, and you're adding a new section at the top, and you have some old code below that. And how do you check that in without a user seeing it? You know, I guess the answer here is pretty obvious. You put it in an if statement. And that if statement looks up some sort of a feature toggle value called a new section. And the key to feature toggles is that they're off by default. If this is the only thing you did, if you just wrapped it in this if statement, the user wouldn't see it. It's off by default, it's kind of like those safety catches are safe by default. What that means is you can wrap your new code in an if statement and check it in, even if it's not finished. I mean, it should probably compile, you don't want the syntax errors checked in, but it doesn't matter if it's unfinished, broken, has bugs, because as long as it's wrapped in this feature toggle, no user will see it. And that means you can make lots and lots of small little commits really quickly without any risk, because it's safe by default. 
Now to turn them on, you have a couple of options. One is just to do it through configuration. And so you can say in the development environment, turn this feature toggle on so I can see it. But in production, it's off by default, but you can also specify it explicitly and say no users will see it. But you can go a little fancier than this and get a lot of power. So what you can do is you create a web service that manages your feature toggles, maybe another web service. And the key thing about this web service is it can actually return different values depending on who the current user is. So maybe for nerd wallet employees, a feature will be on, but for the public at large, the feature will be off. And you can even create a web UI. This is LinkedIn's excellent tool uh, where you can configure what those uh, feature toggles are set to. So here we're setting a feature toggle so that we show it to 1% of US users. So 1% of users will see a certain feature and the other 99%. And the power of feature toggles is now, as I said, you can check in code even if it's not quite finished, even if it has some sort of risky thing. Because feature toggles let you turn it on or off very quickly at will, even in production. And in fact, what we did at LinkedIn uh, is all new features were wrapped in a feature toggle. And by default, it was off. And when we deployed it, it would be off. Then we might turn it on for LinkedIn employees. If everything looked good, then we might turn it on for 1% of users. If everything looked good from there, 10% of users, and so on and so forth. And so we ramped it fully up, or we found problems, and then we just shut it right back on. And this is one of the most powerful tools we have for deploying extremely quickly. You use continuous integration so that your trunk is always in a deployable state, and you use feature toggles so that if you screwed up, you can just shut things off. The other thing you can do is, if you have a feature toggle service, it can actually return different values for different users, and you can use it for bucket testing, for A-B testing. So not only on or off, but maybe one user sees version A, and a different, version, uh, different user sees version B. So these are really, really powerful uh, safety measures for pretty much fast deployment. OK, speedometer, the, the, a few of these sections I think you guys hopefully have taken care of, but uh, obviously the speedometer in your car, tells you how fast you're going. The equivalent of that in software is monitor. Um, <laughs> some of you may be familiar with this gentleman, and we can sit on your board, Mr. David Henke, like to tell us that if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. He's so very ready. Um, there's a lot of different types of monitoring. Monitoring ecosystems are very, very scattered. Uh, so it's helpful to go through it kind of from the highest level to the <coughs> lowest level, and then you get an idea if you have all of these taken care of, maybe you're missing some critical types of monitoring. Um, the highest level is just availability metrics. That's basically the thing your users care about. Is your site up or is it down? It's really a binary question. And you usually need to use some external tool that isn't in your data center so that if your data center goes down, you still know about it. Uh, there's a bunch of tools to do this. Keynote, Pingdom, Uptime Robot, which you can see in the background. Uh, you can actually do it with Route 53 health checks in AWS if you want to. Uh, but that's the basic idea is, is my service up or down? One level below that are the business metrics. This is what the product team, the CEO, care about. What are the users doing? What are they clicking on? How many users are there? How much time are they spending on the site? And to answer those questions, you can use things like Google Analytics, or Kiss Metrics, or Mixed Below that, application metrics. So how many QPS are you seeing? How many, what are the status codes you're setting back? How many errors are you seeing? And some of the tools you might use to do that are things like New Relic, and CloudWatch, and Data. By the way, some of the tools overlap, some of them can do more than one type of monitoring, but just to give you a general idea. Um, log files are also technically an application level form of monitoring. And hopefully you know how to format logs, but even more importantly, you hopefully use some sort of log aggregation, so that instead of having to SSH to each server to read its logs, uh, you have a service that collects all the logs, puts them in one central place where you can search it and, uh, and see it all in one place. And then finally, the lowest level that most people would care about are the server metrics. That's how much CPU are you using, how much memory, hard drive, etc. And for some reason, all the tools in this category have names that are just impossible to pronounce. Nagio, Nagio, Sisin, whatever. So those are the speedometers. Um, warning lights, very closely related, similar concept. Uh, in a car, they tell you when something's wrong. Uh, alerting systems, hopefully you guys have something like that set up to tell you when something is wrong, because obviously you can't sit and look at metrics all day. So you need something to do it for you. 
Uh, most of the monitoring systems I showed in the previous section have alerting features. CloudWatch can send you a text message or an email. Um, most of them can do some sort of alerting. Uh, probably, are you guys using PagerDuty already? Okay. So you're fully familiar with on-call rotations and all of that good stuff. Um, by the way, for a full list of all of those monitoring tools, alerting tools, and a whole bunch of other stuff, I have them all on hellostatic.net. Okay, final item are seatbelts. Um, which obviously help you survive when things do go wrong. So no matter how much you try, no matter how many safety mechanisms you put in place, eventually things will go wrong. And so that's why you have things like seatbelts. And the equivalent of that is a uh, high availability <coughs> architecture. Can't really go into that very much in this talk, so I'm just gonna go over very high level concepts here. I'm guessing this is all old news for most of you guys, but uh, there's basically two types of things we care about. There's stateless servers and stateless. Stateless are things like web servers that don't store any data themselves. And the basic high availability, excuse me, high availability architecture is you deploy multiple copies of a server and you load balance between them. And what's important, especially if you guys are on AWS, is each of those copies should be in a different availability zone, which is just fancy AWS lingo for a different data center. So what happens is if a server goes down or an entire data center goes down, it's okay. You basically route around it and you just go to the other ones that are still there. So you can survive on a crash and have a seat on top of that. Um, the other important thing is you want that server to come back automatically as soon as possible, which you can have all sorts of auto-recovery mechanisms. AWS provides uh, what are called auto-scaling groups, which will do this for you pretty easily. Um, so if you're not using auto-scaling groups across availability zones, you probably are not as available as you could. For stateful, service, or for stateful services, uh, things are a little more complicated. And this is, when I say stateful in this case, I really mean databases or anything that you can only have on a single server. Um, because obviously you can't route between many of them, but you still run multiple instances, and you still run them across multiple data centers. And the key is you send traffic to one of them, a master, and it does replication to the others, the slaves or the revenues. And if the master goes down, then you simply route to one of the replicas, that replica becomes a master, it starts replicating to the other servers, and everybody's happy again. And once again, you use something like an auto scaling group to eventually bring that server back up. So that is really the bare minimum. That is, you know, the, the, the basic lap seatbelt. There's fancier versions of this, the three-point seatbelt and the full harness, but start with this. Hopefully you guys are doing this already. Um, the other thing I will mention, though, which I think a lot of people forget about, is you need to test your seatbelts. You need to have some sort of crash test on that on a regular process verifies that you can recover from crashes. You don't want to wait until something actually happens in production to find out, whoops, forgot to put the seatbelt on. Um, Netflix uh, does something kind of cool with what's called the chaos monkey, where intentionally they run code in their data centers that does crazy stuff for the monkey. It just breaks random things all over their data center. And the reason they do this is they want to make sure that their engineers are regularly seeing <coughs> failures and finding out if their code can handle those failures or not. So I think that's a very good practice because basically a recovery process that you haven't tested does not work. <laughs> the default state of any recovery mechanism is broken, so you have to test it on a regular basis. Hey Jim, quick question. I've heard about Chaos Monkey but don't know much about it. To use something like that, do you have to use other modula like modularity tools during your development process, like the feature on of and other stuff? Because when you can go around randomly killing processes or closing ports or passing bad parameters or you know injecting SQL or something. But there must be, I mean, using a very important tool like Chaos Monkey, does it have requirements in the development process? It's pretty use case specific from what I've seen. Most companies that we've done something like this with, it's very use case specific. So. It really depends what you're ready to test. I mean, the easiest one is usually you just take a server down. That's kind of like your basic process is just pick a server and just shoot it in the head and just see what happens. Does your infrastructure recover from that? Does it, the server come back up? But you can get fancier and fancier. Like you said, you can test all sorts of injection attacks. You can do a lot of things. I think for the startup world, it's enough to do something that basic. A server goes down uh, or maybe a server gets slow. That's also a good thing to test. Okay, so those are the main safety mechanisms I want to talk about. Just the last thing I say is how fast you can go is primarily limited by knowing how much damage you're going to do, right? Because if you just go crazy and reckless, you're going to die. Um, and the other thing I want to say is these things aren't that expensive. 
there's a lot of people that when they hear these things, they say, we don't have time. It takes so much time to set these sort of complicated. But something that I always think about is that highway safety, right? Two cars can drive in opposite directions at 80 or 100 miles an hour, and they can be completely safe because of two yellow lines, right? Safety mechanisms don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be expensive, but they have to be there to protect you. And what you don't want is to be these guys. You don't want to be the ones that are too busy to go faster. So for more info, check out the book. Uh, if you want a free book, tweet out hellostartup.net and hashtag startups. And that's it. Any questions? OK, I'll be here no. for a little while after the talk if anybody wants to. No questions, fella? Talk in person. Yeah. Um, you're talking a lot about these safety mechanisms, um, and you mentioned early on of like most startups fail anyway, most ideas fail anyway. So if you're gonna throw it away, like don't bother with some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And like we're kind of working in a way where we're building up a lot of these different verticals and just kind of seeing what sticks. But we have a ton of overhead and like a lot of like design and planning goes into it. Where like it might just be a bad idea. So like how do you do you have any advice for people going through that of like how do you balance those decisions to be made? If, I think if I had the answer to that, uh, yeah, right. I know. <laughs> the, the universe would look a little different. Um, th there's no easy answer. It is a constant balance. And a lot of it comes down to, I mentioned it with the automated testing, you're sort of trading off the, the cost of building a safety mechanism versus the likelihood that the thing actually goes wrong versus how expensive it's going to be if it goes wrong. Right? And that's, it's just those three factors. You just keep looking at it. So if, you're building something that you're probably going to throw away in a week. And if there's bugs in it or it crashes, it just doesn't matter. You don't need to go crazy and build every safety thing. But if that thing includes payment processing, yeah, you, you have to be a little more careful, right? <coughs> or if that thing is starting to see traction, you don't want to kill your momentum by having that thing go down. So now maybe think about adding a seat belt in case it crashes, right? And you actually might want to work your way up the stack. Recover from crashes, add some monitoring and alerting, and then keep your work working your way but it's just a constant check on those three items. Yeah. A lot of, <coughs> thought about uh, that question. It seems uh, for, for a company where you are doing multiple things at once, there is also a chance where you can leverage other people's safety mechanisms. So there's a difference between safety mechanisms that have to be built in for products, so for example, your automated test suite, versus things that can happen essentially across all products for free, like. Uh, standard integration with New Relic or standard pingdom monitoring for all of our instances. And, and I think investing in those sorts of things that work across our entire ecosystem, are, are those are obvious, easy wins. Plus, we need them for the payment processing and the security anyways, and then everyone gets them for free versus for you, for like the one quick new product that we don't know if it's going to work yet. Maybe don't invest quite so much in automated testing. Yeah. yeah, what you're describing is if you can make the cost of using the safety mechanism really low, then there's no reason you shouldn't use it. And if adding and monitoring to your app takes five minutes, do it. <laughs> it's and when you can amortize that across many different initiatives, that cost drops per initiative. Exactly. So feature flags is another one. <clears throat> Once you build that system up, all of a sudden, just problems are not as severe, right? The cost of a bug is all of a sudden low, because you have to shut that feature up. Um, so things like that, yeah. leverage is a good thing. Very cool. Yes? So two, two questions or comments. One is, uh, if you have dashboard, you know you, you mentioned something about uh, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. But if you measure too many things, that like people actually become blind to it. So you know I've been in situations where there's all sorts of metrics on a dashboard, and nobody is looking at it, and there's a little blip, and nobody pays attention. And the, the analogy with the car, the car has three metrics on it. Yeah. You know speed, RPM, and fuel. You know maybe battery indicator or something like that. And uh, forget about the new cars, but the accident rate was pretty low with just those three indicators. Yeah, the, the opposite of if you can't measure it, you can't fix it, is what gets measured gets fixed. So you have to be really careful which metrics you're paying attention to, because they're going to create incentives in the company. Right? If the right. only thing you care about is traffic, then you're going to start optimizing for that, possibly at the cost of conversions right, or something like that. So something that I've seen for product developments that I think is actually just as important as product development is what's called the magic. Um, this came from companies like Facebook, where they found out that 
if a user in their first week, if a new user signs up, and in their first week they connect with seven friends, they'll become a very, very active uh, Facebook user. So that was the magic number. They optimized the whole company to get you connected, something like seven friends in the first 10 days or the first week. And the, the thing about the magic number is not that it's necessarily the perfect metric or any of that, it's just that it's one simple metric to pay attention to that you can rally the whole company. And it's just like you're saying, it's like a speedometer and an odometer and a gas gauge. Focus everything on that and you'll probably be fine. So for engineering, you may want to identify some of the things, right? I don't know if that's GPS or error rates or latencies, whatever makes sense for your use case, but get a small number of them, put them on a dashboard, alert only around them, and you're probably more successful than watching every single thing in the universe and every single So the other, other thing is something you haven't mentioned. Um, but a lot of uh, flight safety actually came about because of the use of checklists. Mm. And uh, uh, checklists in the context of software development, what do you say about that? Uh, totally agree. So <laughs> the original version of this slide deck was even longer, um, so I had to chop it down. Uh, but one of the things in there was talking about, for example, things like code reviews as another really interesting safety mechanism. Um, and one of the things you have to do to be successful at code reviews, usually, is you have that checklist of things to look for. Um, there's actually a book called, I think it's The Checklist Manifesto, yeah. and it, it'll give you a real appreciation for how simple a little piece of paper with squares to the left of some text really is. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful safety mechanism, just a basic list of things to look at. Uh, and I've used them in code reviews. Uh, hopefully you don't need them as much in programming because we can automate a lot of checklists. You can write code to go through the checklist and do it for you. Um, they're still very <laughs> Cool. Other questions? Yep. Maybe to logically extrapolate the question from earlier, have you ever seen uh, companies that go too far in terms of sort of making their processes robust and what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, the at the end of the day, I mean, the whole talk aside, at the end of the day, like what your users care about is a working product. And there have definitely been companies where they built the most awe-inspiring infrastructure ever. That was like invincible. It survived earthquakes and alien invasions. But they didn't have a product. <laughs> and they went out of business. And, and the reason is pretty straightforward, right? Startups have a limited runway. You have so much money, which means you have so much time, and you have to make more money. And so what you're constantly trading off is how much of that time am I spending building safety mechanisms and how much of my time am I building the actual product that the user cares about. And 100% of one or 100% of the other is not going to be effective. And I have seen startups that go in both directions. Most startups are the opposite. They just they focus 100% ship product, ship product, ship product, and they don't notice that they're actually going really slow. You know? um, a small number did the opposite. They were shipping infrastructure, shipping infrastructure, and the product just never got um, again, the balance comes down to those same three points. What is the benefit you're getting? Right? I, I put up there how you shouldn't test everything. It doesn't make sense to test everything. But there are people who go for 100% code coverage on everything they write, and I think that's a bad trade-off, because the cost of those bugs is probably really low. And the cost of not shipping your product before you run out of money, higher. Do you think that investing in those processes and those tools, I mean, from the perspective of this company, we're looking at hiring a ton of people in the next year, like more than in this room, by maybe double, I don't know, like really quickly, but like that probably makes it more important to invest in these processes. The payoff is more valid, like valuable, right? Yeah, so I don't know if I'll be able to find it quickly, but if I go back to that slide, let's see. <coughs> so, I showed you bug density as a code base grows. The same is going to be true if the number of developers grows. And the, the important thing here is it grows faster. It's not linear, it's super linear, right? So if you invest now, you'll be able to kind of temper that curve a little bit. If you wait too long, fighting the code base after that is really hard. Again, speaking from the LinkedIn experience and folks at LinkedIn confirm, we got to the point where we basically couldn't do code. Like we just couldn't make changes to the site. At some point, it was so hard to deploy. Am, am I right? Like, we had to cancel deployments because we just couldn't get them to work or couldn't get the code stable. 
So it's because uh, we waited a little too long on that curve. Mm -hmm. We got to way over half a million lines of code, and, and yeah. it's just out of control. And so it is a balance, but if you know you're about to have explosive growth, then I guarantee you the process you have today will not work. One of the things that's actually really interesting to think about is um, people like to talk about high scalability, how scalable something is. But something isn't scalable or not scalable. It's not a binary. It's scalable for a certain load and a certain set of characteristics, right? And it turns out that the processes in your company are also scalable for a certain number of developers, a certain amount of code, a certain product load. And the key thing about scaling that you'll hear about anybody that builds scalable systems is the thing that works for 100 QPS, it does not work at all for 1,000 QPS, does not work at all for 1,000 QPS. You have to do something completely, totally different. You can't just throw a little more you know, CPU at it or something. You have to re-architect it entirely. Um, so if you know you're about to double, if you know <laughs> things are about to go uh, a little crazy, then you really need to start investing in that stuff. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say in Q1, Q2, Q3 of 2010, we were supposed to ship twice a week. I think on the average we shipped once a month. <laughs> and we also had downtime. Yeah because the code deployment process was so clunky, also because the service graph had gone out of control and uh, everybody was trampling on each other, remember? Before Superblocks was done, the service graph was, we actually drew it out on a piece of paper. It was like, we couldn't understand it. It was it, really it, hard. It wasn't a piece of paper, it was like a diagram. It was a diagram, <laughs> which we put on a wall, actually. And, and to yeah. be fair, I keep making fun of LinkedIn, but like, they fix this stuff, right? Yeah. LinkedIn deploys like 50 times a day now. Like, yeah. And the way they did it is these safety mechanisms that I talked about, continuous integration, and feature flags and automated testing, automated tests that are fast. Actually, LinkedIn, speaking of over-investing, um, LinkedIn had a test suite that took like 14 hours to run yeah. or something like that. And we would have to run it after all the check-ins completed yeah. for the final push, yeah. and then shit would break, and then developers would not be found to fix them. So four, 14 hours isn't valuable. Like yeah. literally, we <laughs> actually improved things by deleting a ton of slow, flaky tests. So. You know, but at the end of the day, like we fixed it. Like, the company is moving much faster than it ever was back then. Um, so these things are worth it. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was exposed to an interesting concept recently where it's like if you ship n amount of stuff in a year, you're going to need n plus n times one point two five <laughs> next year to maintain what you shipped last year and ship the same amount. Is that What's what's your experience there? It's hard to judge on, on something at such an abstract level, I guess. Right. Um, one thing I will say, uh, there's a book uh, called The Singularity is Near, old book, really famous. And one of the concepts there is this idea that we are at the cusp where technology is going to take over our lives, and AI is going to change everything, blah, blah, blah. But the main argument in there is that humans are really bad at thinking about exponential growth, like really, really, really bad exponential growth. Um, and so, you know, something like this. If you shuffle a deck of cards and you do it well, that particular order of cards has never before been seen in the history of the universe. Because 52 factorial is an astonishingly large number. And it's really, it's like the intuition about that is hard, right? Or if you fold a piece of paper, I think, 32 times, if you fold it in half, 32 times, it's going to reach to the moon. Right, so like we're not good at thinking about exponential growth. And what we're discussing here is basically exponential growth. And so I think that's what you're alluding to. Like to sustain what you did now, you need to invest even more. Um, that's basically what it is. is. Exponential growth is really hard to reason about. And the thing you do today, it's not going to be just, oh, we're double the size of the company. We need twice as much work. You might need eight times as much work to keep up with it. Um, but the exact numbers, I mean, nobody knows them. It's, you do it based on experience, and you do it based on those three trade offs likelihood and costs. Uh, this is a public service announcement, other than thanking Jim. Yay, Jim. <laughs> thanks, guys. All right. Yeah. And thanks to Matt. Just, um, yeah.